Well, good morning. It is good to be gathered again gathered together again this morning when we celebrate the baptism of our Lord and we remember again our own baptism as it binds us to Christ and to one another. We are grateful that you have chosen to be with us this morning or whatever time of day it may be, whether you have been a longtime member of this congregation or you might be joining us for the first time. We are grateful that we might be gathered in this particular place, in this particular way as the world Uh, continues to churn around us as turmoil continues to persist, that we might find grounding in this place, gathered with this community, gathered around this word and anticipating the Spirit's presence with us. We're grateful to be together in worship this morning. Uh, Just a few announcements, the first being that we will have another special called Charge Conference of our church so that we might elect our lay leaders for the coming year. So that will be at 6 p.m. on uh, January 19th. Uh, If you're used to coming to church council meetings, it will be at the beginning of our regularly scheduled church council meeting. It should only take a few minutes, um, and then we'll carry on with the rest of the business. But if you are uh, interested in coming to that opportunity to uh, vote and to be present to the sharing of our leaders, you're welcome to come on the 19th on Tuesday. Uh, Pastor Jerry is also continuing to lead Bible study on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. via Zoom. We hope that you'll come to that as well. But friends, we have gathered here to listen for the word of God this morning. And this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Church of God united to serve one common Lord, proclaim to all one message with hearts in glad accord. Christ ever goes before us, we follow day by day with strong and eager pray with me. God in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to Children's Time. Today's scripture is from Mark 1, 9 through 11. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. Jesus was coming up out of the water. Just then he saw the heaven being torn open. Jesus saw the Holy Spirit coming down on him like a dove. A voice spoke to him from heaven. It said, you are my son and I love you. I am very pleased with you. Uh, Today, I have a set of keys in my hand. Uh, Keys are used to open doors and unlock doors. Uh, It could open a car to make it, and then you put it in the ignition to make it go. Uh, You might even have a key for like a little box or a journal. Uh, Each week, I'm going to be showing you one key. Uh, And the key word uh, will help us know how to follow Jesus. Jesus told people to follow him. And in the coming weeks, we will hear stories about people who did just that. They followed Jesus for their entire life. Uh, Today's key word is baptize. It even says it on the key right here. Baptize means to sprinkle, pour on, or cover a person with water. And it's a sign that the person is a follower of Jesus. During Jesus' life, people began bapti- or people being baptized would be dipped under the water in a river or a stream. The water of the baptism shows how God washes away our mistakes and claims us to live a life fresh and new. When Jesus was a young man, he was baptized in the Jordan River. John the Baptist was a holy man who told people to follow God. John would baptize them, and John baptized Jesus. When Jesus came up from the water, there was a voice from God that said, You are my son, and I love you. I am very pleased. And a dove came down from heaven. Today, followers of Jesus practice baptism in several different ways. Some people dip all the way underwater. Uh, Sometimes the minister will sprinkle water on the head of a person. Uh, This is the way that babies and small children are baptized in the United Methodist Church. However baptism is done, we are reminded that God chooses us and is pleased with us. When we see someone else being baptized, we remember our own baptism. We remember how much Jesus loves us too. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
and people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, we come again seeking this day your word and your wisdom. We pray that you would open to us this message, that you would speak to us this day, and show us the way you would call us to go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's commonly believed by scholars that Mark is the oldest of the four Gospels, dated around 70 BC or AD or CE, my pardon me. Biblical scholars have identified this Gospel as a common source text to at least two of the other Gospels, meaning that Matthew and Luke both compiled their witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in light of Mark's account. As we know, every author or historian has their own interpretive lens through which they cast their retelling of any story, whether it be a family history or a local legend or even a gospel account. And this year, for the next several weeks, we will be walking through the season of Epiphany, hearing from Mark's version of the revelation of Jesus uh, in God. As someone who loves to read the Bible through a literary lens, I will admit Mark's take is a little stark for my taste usually. For instance, whereas Matthew begins his gospel with the long genealogy of Jesus from David to Joseph, and Luke describes the angels appearing to both Elizabeth and Mary with good news of babies on the way, Mark begins with a grown-up John the Baptist calling for repentance and foretelling Jesus' arrival. We begin in Mark somewhat midstream with John's proclamation and Jesus entering the Jordan River. Mark begins as if to say, let's cut to the chase, move ahead to the action. And here on the bank of this river is where the ministry of Jesus begins. And it's a lot like God to mark a beginning with a revelatory word. In the first chapter of the book of our scriptures of Genesis, we read, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God's voice from the beginning broke into the watery chaos of disorder with a simple command, And so began the ordering of the world. Of course, we know big bangs and evolution play a role also, but we learn from the tradition of our faith that when God is active and at work in our world, God tells us so. God spoke to Abraham to promise him descendants to fill many nations. He spoke to and wrestled with Jacob and named him Israel. He spoke to Moses and through him dictated his commandments for the Hebrew people. And unlike some preachers, God is often careful with word count and clarity of message, less verbose and more concise, pretty straightforward. And here on the riverbank, we do not hear a long discourse explaining who Jesus is and what his mission will be or exactly how God will be present through him to us, to humanity. Instead, Mark tells us through John that God is sending the Messiah. Then almost immediately Jesus appears and we are let in on the private revelation God speaks to Jesus in his baptism. You are my son, the beloved. 
With you, I am well pleased. Matthew leaned on ancestry, Luke, the divine messengers, and Mark, simply the word of God itself to reveal to us the identity of the Messiah in Jesus. It's no accident that our practice of baptism as a sacrament of the church also binds us to a new identity, or rather reveals in us a true identity. We, in light of this gospel narrative, also offer ourselves to this same ritual of repentance and commitment, marking for us, like Jesus, the beginning of a new journey, a new calling. For in several of the gospel accounts, the story goes the same way. Jesus arrives to be baptized. God pronounces him as God's son. Sometimes, as in Mark, just to Jesus himself, and other times to the full crowd who's gathered there. And then Jesus sets off on his ministry, first through the temptations in the desert, then on to call his disciples, then into the cities and countrysides to preach and teach and heal. But first, his identity is confirmed. His relationship to and with God is assured. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. A former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, has written a short yet illuminating book called Being Christian, which is one of my favorite books to study with new and uh, reviving disciples alike. It anchors the reader to four pillars of our tradition, baptism, scripture, Eucharist or communion, and prayer. And it describes how these four foundational aspects shape our identity as Christians. Sometimes these elements of our faith are poorly taught or de-emphasized in their complexity and seen more as accessories than the foundations of our life of faith. But Father Williams demystifies some of their symbolism, which helps us to fall in step with the one we claim to follow. Because even for the seminary trained, baptism is an utter mystery. We know that Jesus himself was baptized and that he commanded his disciples to go into all the world baptizing in his name. We know it continued to be a practice in the ancient church and still to this day is a significant mark of one's Christian identity. We know that as a sacrament, baptism is believed to be an outward sign of an inward grace and that through the tangible water, we experience something of God's infinite love. But as to the how, we leave that up to God. One thing that seems more clear about our practice of baptism is that it signifies our bonds to one another as members of the one body of Christ in the world and to the communion of saints who have gone before. You may remember seeing a baptism of a baby in this church or in another, where upon the completion of the liturgy, the pastor or the godparent walks the new member of the congregation through the aisle so the congregation may see and celebrate their new sibling in Christ. This is why, whether baptized as an adult or an infant, our tradition insists that baptisms not be done in private or as a family event alone because part of the power of the ritual is our commitments made to one another, almost like marriage vows, to uphold and support and encourage one another as faithful disciples and members together in this broad family, the family of not even just this congregation, but the church universal, to all who follow Jesus anywhere. And there are some of us who feel truly this connection, who trust in this identity as members and siblings when we enter into any church. We have been raised in or have witnessed this kind of embrace in a loving congregation, such that whatever church we enter, or maybe even it extends to whatever new community we enter, we experience a sense of assurance and belonging. Our very identity has been assured by the church that received us in love, so much so that it grounds us even through change, through dislocation, through uncertainty. 
I think it isn't coincidence that God claimed Jesus as his beloved son and affirmed that already in him God was well pleased before Jesus' true work began. Because it is this kind of grounding trust in our belovedness, in our value to another, that gives us strength to face hardship and temptation. It is this reminder of our identity and relationship to God and one another that gives us confidence to withstand the suffering or obstacles or disappointments we may inevitably face. And as Father William suggests, the waters of baptism, or at least the waters of Jesus' baptism, are not clean and clear. Entering into the Jordan is to knowingly enter into the muddiness to the murkiness of creation, to accept our bonds to the people and circumstances who all who enter that water with us. Jesus didn't begin his ministry on a mountaintop shining with God's glory. He began in humility, standing on the same shore with all who came to repent of their sin, with all who would acknowledge the pain and brokenness of their lives, the hurts they had endured or inflicted, the hope they had for greater justice and peace. It was there in the murkiness of suffering and grace that God revealed God's self to Jesus. And it is there in that same murkiness that God meets us and claims us also. And this is helpful to recognize here at the beginning of a new year that we hoped might be a turning point into greater clarity or greater uh, order to feel less fear and isolation. But just six days in, the death toll of the pandemic continues to soar, so much so that we are desensitized to the numbers on the news representing actual fathers and daughters and sisters and wives. Just six days in, a violent insurrection plays out on American soil, the kind of thing the United States used to forcefully prevent in other nations, now incited by an elected leader whose greatest fear is the loss of his own power rather than the destruction of our entire democracy or the well-being of our nation. Friends, I know that we needed a feel-good sermon today. I know that we needed to hear about God's love for us, lifting us up and giving us strength to face chaos and fear we endure day after day. But we cannot, as people of faith, hide from the muddiness of the world we live in. Baptism doesn't somehow prevent us from getting dirty. It doesn't separate us from the ugliness of the world. It doesn't elevate us above those we despise or mark us as somehow superior. Baptism sinks us down in the sludge, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus our Lord, who gave up every ounce of his own transcendence to prove to us that love is presence, love is empathy, Love is reconciliation. Jesus entered into the ugliness, the violence, the despicable selfishness and greed and contempt of our humanity to show us that we need not live in this constant war with one another. We need not seek power to know belonging and to feel valued in community. We need not threaten the existence of others unlike us, of those less privileged than us, let alone traumatize them with symbols of their destruction and elimination as we saw with the noose erected in our capital just Wednesday. We don't need those things in order to feel important or worthy. Jesus stooped to our level. He waded into our dysfunction and insecurity to remind us that there is nothing that we can achieve and no sin we can commit that will earn or diminish God's love for us. No power we can wield or weakness we can experience that will change our value to God or the community that is building God's kingdom. We might be a newborn baby or a criminal on death row the extremely privileged or the poverty born, the registered voter whose candidate was elected or the one whose wasn't, 
And still we are God's beloved, forgiven and set free to live and love as Jesus commands. But it is a risky place to make a commitment to God and one another here on the riverbank because the world rejects this kind of overturning of its principles of survival. The Jews and the Romans of Jesus' time could not stomach the principles of a beloved community that would undermine their lust for power. Immediately following his baptism, Mark tells us that Jesus is sent into the desert where he is tempted. He is offered all of the wealth and food and power that is in the world if he would only give up his allegiance, his obedience to God. Everything the world tells us is desirable was there in his reach, and he turns away. He turns away. His identity in God, his belovedness and call to love is of greater value to him than any power that the world could give. In our baptismal vows, too, we commit to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, to reject the evil powers of this world and to repent of our sin, to accept the freedom and power that God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, to confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, to put our whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him in union with all the church and all nations. We make these promises, whether for ourselves or for our children, to live according to the example of Christ that we may be faithful disciples. In our baptism, we too are told that we are God's beloved and recipients of God's unmerited, unconditional love but we live as baptized Christians when we reject the worldly instincts to overpower and intimidate and forcefully take what we desire most. We live as baptized Christians and faithful disciples when we put our trust in his grace, when faced with our fears and insecurities and shame, and we choose love anyway. If we believe and know that we are God's beloved, we are confident that we will know belonging and abundance. We know that we will experience comfort and hope. We know that we will not have to fight and claw and destroy our way to feel valued or to know peace. I look back on my life and the dozens of churches that I have attended and served some for only a season and some for many formative years. In those churches, I was loved by staunch Republicans and flaming liberals. In those churches, I was embraced by near fundamentalists and worship attending humanists. I shared communion with people who hurt me and with people whose love transformed my life. I was received in baptism by people who loved others conditionally and people who delighted in me because I was simply a child of God just like them. And what I know of the church is that we are far from perfect most of the time. We are not the shining example of how people should live. We are a huddled mass on the riverbank demonstrating that we hope for something different and hopefully committing to our vows in that muddy river to ascent to a divine order greater than the one built on power and greed, to the one that cares nothing about winners or losers but seeks relationship and knows that one person's flourishing is always bound together with the others. Today, I pray that we too will renew our commitment to put our trust in Jesus' grace, that we will remember why we chose to be a part of this community and follow this Savior who promises us no power or wealth, but love and peace. 
I pray that we will reject the conditioning that we must despise our neighbor of an opposing party, that we must fear those who are other, that we must win or bear unthinkable shame. We are, you are God's beloved, with whom God is well pleased. And this is our true identity. Under any hats or flags or shirts we might bear. May we reject the forces that separate us and humbly step into the waters again, muddy and murky as they may be, seeking this confidence and strength that we belong to God and to one another. May it be so. Amen. Well, friends, on this day, when we remember the baptism of our Lord, we would usually be gathered in this place and celebrate a remembrance of baptism together, that we might come forward and touch the waters and remember that day when we, too, had this prayer of blessing prayed over us, when God also pronounced us as part of this family. And today, we might have to do it a little bit differently but we pray that wherever you are, uh, whatever time it may be, whoever you're watching with, whether you have been baptized or not, that you might enter into this time with us as we remember the commitments we made to God in our baptism. And we invite you to prayerfully reflect on these questions as they are asked of all of us, that you might be holding them in your heart, considering them, and that as we uh, participate in a little bit of a fun remembrance that um, you too might have an opportunity to celebrate that God has bound us to God and one another through this ritual. Let us join in this remembrance together. Siblings in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, God's Spirit has been poured out upon water, water poured over and immersing us, water that flows freely for all who receive it, water from the streams of God's saving power and justice, water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness, water that refreshes life, nurtures growth, and offers new birth. Today we come to the waters to renew our commitments together to Christ who has raised us, the Spirit who has birthed us, and the Creator who is making all things new. And so I ask you, reflecting upon these questions in the silence of your own heart, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? Will you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? Will you let the Spirit use you as prophets to the powers that be? Will you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves? Will you proclaim the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ, being Christ's body on earth? Will you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as our Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all cultures, ages, races, sexual orientations, gender, identities, abilities, and ethnicities? Will you be living witnesses to the gospel individually and together wherever you are in, and in all you do? Will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Will you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ? Will you affirm and teach the faith of the whole church as we put our trust in one God, the Almighty Creator, in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, and in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever? Will 
Friends, may we say together, I will with God's help. I will will with with God's God's help. help. Amen and amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. By water and your word you claimed us as your children, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be all glory and praise through Christ with your Holy Spirit now and forever, and together we say, Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I think the most uh, enjoyable part of remembrances of baptism or baptism in general is our opportunity to touch the water, to remember uh, this life-giving element that God has prepared for us. One of my favorite things about baptisms with babies is how much they splash in the water and how much they delight in this gift that God has given us. And while we're unable to partake together in this moment, um, Pastor Jerry and I are grateful to be in this space, that we are surrounded by not only the waters of creation as they are reminded, uh, as we are reminded of them in our windows in this beautiful sanctuary, remembering the creation when God brought order to our lives, but also that uh, we might be surrounded by the cloud of witnesses who is gathered in this place whenever we are present or not. For all the members of this one body who have been present here as they grew in faith, as they were accepted into membership, as they were celebrated in marriage or remembered in their memorial. And uh, this day, we shower these pews in remembrance of you all, wherever you may be. And we encourage you as you encounter water at different times in this week, perhaps it's when you're diligently washing your hands, um, that you might also remember this gift of our bondedness to one another through God's good gift. May we remember our baptism and be thankful. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, you spoke into the chaos and called creation into being. You spoke and all that has form and life began. Your voice is still being heard in rushing waters, claps of thunders, and burning cries. All creation proclaims glory Lord, you continue to call us to hear and to respond to your voice, whether it is a still, small voice or the proclamation of your word. You invite us to discern your voice above all other voices and proclaim glory. You, O Lord, call us to immerse ourselves in your word of life, your holy truth, your abundant grace, 
not for ourselves alone, but for the building of your kingdom now and in years to come. Jesus, Lord of life, you led the way for us to submerge ourselves into a new life, one of love for all creation and for all people, one that offers us forgiveness for our sins and brings us into your church. Spirit of God, you move us to transform our hearts and minds from the ways of the world to the righteousness of your kingdom from a life embroiled in conflict to a life that embraces your truth for your glory and for our freedom. These past days have shown us that we need you, O oh Lord, to transform us from our willfulness to your holiness, from our way of thinking to your call upon us, from our judgment to your understanding. Hear our prayers as we open our hearts and minds to you in this time of silence. Lord, as we have opened ourselves to you, fill us with your vision, your words, and your guidance so that we might move in accordance with you and in doing so fulfill the prayer your son Jesus, the beloved, taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends of St. Mark's, thank you for your gifts and your offerings. We are grateful for the ways that you continue to support the congregation of this church for the building of God's kingdom through our missional work that comes from this campus into the world. It is through your gifts that the gospel of Jesus is shared for all. We give you thanks, however it is that you give your offerings.
We give you thanks, O oh God, for every blessing and spiritual gift you have poured out upon us. Let the gifts of our lives be a source of blessing in your world, all, the, all to the glory of your holy name. Amen. as we go from this place into what may feel like the watery, dark chaos of our world, may we remember that God speaks over us, calling order and telling us that we are beloved. We are God's beloved with whom God is already well pleased. And our belonging, our value is here in community with one another as we seek God's love and God's kingdom. May that assurance Bring us peace this day and always. Amen. Jesus footsteps tread and to his will. 